Think about it. Every single day you touch paper. You jot down notes, unwrap a package, read a receipt, maybe even flip through a book or newspaper. But here's the wild part. All of that paper started out as a tree. Yep, those tall giants swaying in the forest eventually end up as smooth white sheets in your printer tray. The question is, how? How do you take something as solid and strong as wood and turn it into something thin, flexible, and let's be honest, terrible? That's the story we're telling today. And trust me, it's a massive, mind-blowing process that spans forests, logging trucks, and mega factories the size of football stadiums. So grab your notebook, because by the end of this video, you'll know exactly how millions of tons of paper are made from trees every single year. Let's start where every sheet of paper begins, in the forest. Step one, harvesting the right trees. Here's the thing, not every tree is destined to become paper. Paper makers are picky. The best candidates are softwood trees like pine, spruce, and fir, plus some hardwoods like birch and eucalyptus. Why these? It all comes down to fibers. See, wood is made of cellulose fibers bound together by lignin, which is the natural glue that makes trees tough. The long fibers from softwoods give paper strength and durability. The shorter fibers from hardwoods, they make the paper smooth and good for writing or printing. Most factories blend both to get the best of both worlds. Now before you imagine loggers hacking down ancient forests, here's the reality. Most paper today comes from managed plantations. Think of them as tree farms. In places like Scandinavia, Canada, and Brazil, entire forests are grown just for paper. A pine might grow for 15 to 25 years before it's harvested, while eucalyptus trees can be ready in just seven years. And every tree cut down is usually replaced by planting at least one or two more. Sustainable forestry is a big deal in this industry. So how do they actually harvest these giants? Enter the machines, and trust us, they're beasts. The star player is the feller buncher or modern harvester. This machine rolls up to a tree, grabs it with a claw, slices through the trunk in seconds, and neatly stacks it with dozens of others. It's like watching a claw machine at the arcade, but supersized and way more efficient. Then come the skidders and forwarders, machines that drag or carry the felled logs out of the forest to collection points. From there, they're loaded onto massive trucks or even floated down rivers and shipped by barge in some regions. Those trucks, packed to the brim with freshly cut logs, are headed straight to the paper mill. And once they arrive, that's where the transformation really begins. Step 2. Debarking and Chipping When logs reach the mill, they're still covered in bark. And here's the thing about bark. It's not great for paper. Bark fibers are rough, uneven, and full of impurities that make weak, low-quality sheets. So the very first step is to strip it all away. How do you debark thousands of logs a day? With sheer brute force. Picture a debarking drum, a steel cylinder the size of a bus that spins like a washing machine. Logs are tumbled inside, banging against each other until the bark is knocked clean off. In some mills, high-pressure water jets blast the bark away in seconds. But don't think that the bark goes to waste. Nope. Most mills burn it as biofuel to generate steam and electricity for the factory. In fact, many paper mills are partly energy self-sufficient thanks to all that leftover bark. Once the logs are clean and smooth, it's time to shrink them down. Way down because you can't just toss whole logs into a paper machine. The logs are fed into industrial chippers, which slice them into chunks about the size of coins or bottle caps. Conveyor belts carry mountains of these chips into enormous storage piles that look like golden wood-scented dunes. But here's something you might not know. Not every chip makes the cut. Mills use vibrating screens to separate them by size. Too big, and they won't cook properly later too small and they'll just dissolve into mush. Only chips in the Goldilocks zone move forward. The rest are rechipped or used as fuel. By now, those towering logs have been reduced to millions of tiny chips. And it's those chips that will go through the biggest transformation yet, turning solid wood into soft pulp. Step 3. The Pulping Process 
Here's where the real magic happens, pulping. This is the heart of paper making. Remember, wood is basically two things, cellulose fibers, which is what we want, and lignin, what we don't. Pulping is all about breaking wood apart and freeing those cellulose fibers so they can form new sheets. There are two main ways to do it, mechanical pulping and chemical pulping. Let's break them down. Mechanical pulping is exactly what it sounds like, brute force. Imagine giant grinding stones or rotating discs pressing against the wood chips, shredding the fibers loose. This method is fast and cheap, and it squeezes out almost every bit of fiber from the wood. But there's a catch. It leaves a lot of lignin behind. That means the paper tends to be weaker and yellows quickly with age. Perfect for newspapers, phone books, or magazines that don't need to last forever. Now let's talk about the heavyweight champion, chemical pulping specifically the craft process, which is the most common today. In this method, wood chips are dumped into giant digesters, which are steel towers as tall as a building. Inside, the chips are cooked under high pressure with a mix of chemicals like sodium hydroxide and sodium sulfide. These chemicals dissolve the lignin, freeing the cellulose fibers almost completely. The result? Strong, durable pulp that makes high-quality paper. It's more expensive and time-consuming than mechanical pulping but the paper it produces is so much better. Think books, office paper, cardboard boxes, things you want to be sturdy. Here's another cool fact. The craft process is designed to recycle almost everything. The dissolved lignin and leftover chemicals form what's called black liquor, and instead of wasting it, mills burn it in recovery boilers to generate even more energy. So in a way, the paper mill is like a giant self-sustaining ecosystem. Some mills also use semi-chemical pulping, a mix of both worlds, but the big players are mechanical and chemical. By the end of this stage, those humble wood chips are unrecognizable. They've been transformed into a mushy, foamy mixture called pulp, the raw ingredient of paper. And this pulp? It's ready for its makeover into clean white sheets. And that's where we'll pick up next, cleaning and bleaching. The step that takes brown, mushy pulp and turns it into the bright white stuff we're all used to. If you've been enjoying this process so far, don't forget to like and subscribe for even more amazing videos. Step 4. Cleaning and bleaching the pulp At this stage, our wood chips have been cooked down and shredded into pulp, but it doesn't exactly look like the crisp white paper we use every day. Right now, it's more like a muddy milkshake brown, foamy, full of leftover lignin, dirt, and little bits of bark. If we tried to press it into sheets as is, you'd end up with something closer to a grocery bag than a notebook page. So what happens next? It's spa day for pulp, a multi-stage cleaning and brightening process. First, the pulp is screened. Giant machines push the mixture through fine mesh screens that trap any chunks that didn't break down properly. Things like knots of wood or bark fragments. Think of it like running a smoothie through a strainer to catch the seeds. Next, the pulp heads to cleaning cyclones or centrifuges, where sand, dirt, and even tiny pieces of metal sink out. This is critical, because any impurities left behind could ruin the papermaking machines later on. After screening and cleaning, the pulp is washed over and over. Huge washers push clean water through the fibers to rinse out the last of the cooking chemicals. Imagine doing laundry. But instead of a basket of clothes, it's thousands of gallons of pulpy fiber swirling in tanks. Now, if the end goal is brown paper, like cardboard boxes or grocery bags, the pulp can stop here. But for most white papers, there's one more key step, bleaching. In the past, mills used chlorine glass to bleach pulp. It made the paper brilliantly white, but also produced toxic byproducts that were bad news for rivers and ecosystems. Today, most modern mills use safer alternatives like oxygen, ozone, hydrogen peroxide, or chlorine dioxide. These methods still brighten the pulp and remove leftover lignin, but with far less environmental damage. The difference is stunning. In just a few cycles of washing and bleaching, that murky brown pulp transforms into a fluffy, snow-white fiber mix. If you scooped it up in your hands, it would look like cotton candy floating in water. At this point, the pulp is about 99% water and just 1% fiber, but those fibers are exactly what will become paper. 
the next step? Turning this soupy mixture into thin, strong sheets that stretch hundreds of meters across a machine. Step 5. Forming the paper sheets Okay, here's where things get dramatic, because this is the stage where pulp actually becomes paper. The pulp slurry is poured onto a moving wire mesh screen at one end of a machine called the Forge Rainier. This machine is the beating heart of any paper mill, and it can be as long as two football fields. Yes, you heard that right, two football fields. At the start, the pulp is watery and loose. It looks like cloudy soup splashing onto a conveyor belt. But as the belt moves forward, gravity and suction drains away most of the water, leaving behind a thin, wet mat of fibers. What's happening here is actually pretty amazing. Each cellulose fiber has tiny hooks and surface bonds. As the water drains out, these fibers start clinging to each other, tangling and locking together like Velcro. Without a single drop of glue, the fibers naturally form a sheet. Of course, this new paper web is still fragile and dripping wet, so the next job is to press and dry it. The wet sheet presses through a series of press rollers that squeeze out even more water. You can hear the hiss and thump as massive cylinders press down, leaving the sheet stronger and smoother each time. Then comes drying. The paper is pulled across rows of steam-heated cylinders, enormous metal drums that evaporate the last of the moisture. You can actually see the sheet tightening up and strengthening as it snakes its way across dozens of these hot rollers. By the time it reaches the end of the machine, that weak, watery pulp has transformed into a continuous ribbon of paper hundreds of meters long. And here's the jaw dropper. These machines move insanely fast. Some can run over 60 kilometers per hour, spitting out paper almost faster than your eye can follow. To give you perspective, a single Ford Drinier machine can produce a roll of paper wider than a highway lane, running nonstop, day and night. And here's a fun fact. If you stood at the start of one of these machines and watched a single sheet move to the end, you'd see it shrink by more than half its width. That's because as it dries, the fibers pull tightly together, giving us the dense, strong paper we're used to. At this point, the sheet is strong enough to handle, smooth enough to write on, and dry enough to last. All that's left is to roll it up and get it ready for the world. Step 6. Rolling and Cutting Imagine the world's biggest toilet paper roll. That's what comes next. As the paper leaves the drying cylinders, it's wound into enormous rolls called parent reels or jumbo rolls. And when we say enormous, we mean it. A single reel can be as wide as 10 meters, weigh up to 60 tons, and stand taller than a two-story house. Picture a single roll of toilet paper big enough to crush a small car. That's what we're talking about here. Watching one get lifted across the factory floor is like seeing a cruise ship anchor being hoisted. It's that massive. These reels are the factory's way of storing continuous sheets until they can be cut. Because no one needs a roll of paper the size of a truck, at least not directly. So the reels are moved to rewinders and slitters, specialized cutting machines that slice the giant roll into smaller, usable rolls or sheets. Picture a massive guillotine that chops through layers of paper with razor-sharp precision, turning that single mega roll into stacks of printer paper, rolls of newsprint, or packaging sheets. These industrial slicers are programmed with laser accuracy to chop the jumbo rolls into different formats. Standard printer paper? That's cut down to 8.5 by 11 inches, or A4 if you're outside the US. Newspaper? Cut into huge sheets perfect for presses. Packaging? trimmed and rolled to fit the needs of box factories. And here's where paper starts to diversify. Thin, lightweight paper might be sent off for books or notebooks. Heavy-duty grades become cardboard, packaging, or even paper cups. And here's a fun twist. Nothing goes to waste. Even the tiniest trimmings and offcuts are scooped up and sent right back into the pulping process. So, in a way, the factory is a closed loop. The scraps of one batch can become part of the next. Some types of paper get a finishing touch. For glossy magazines or high-quality posters, the sheets go through a process called coating or glazing. Picture a machine brushing or spraying on a super thin layer of minerals or chemicals that give the paper that sleek, shiny look. That's why your fashion magazine feels silky smooth compared to your math homework notebook. 
It's the same base material, just dressed up for the occasion. Step 7. Packaging and Distribution Then comes packaging. Those giant reels we talked about? They're either wrapped as they are and shipped to other factories, like packaging plants or print presses, or sliced down into the smaller reams you buy at the store. Think about the standard 500 sheet pack of printer paper you toss in your office printer. Those were once part of a massive reel spinning in a factory the size of a warehouse. Finally, it's time for distribution. Trucks, trains, and even ships carry these products out to the world. From publishers who print books and newspapers, to companies making cereal boxes, to offices churning out reports, to schools that never seem to stop handing out worksheets. Paper fans out across the globe in countless forms. And just like that, the journey from tree to everyday life is complete. Fun fact, some of these mills run so efficiently that paper cut today can be on a store shelf tomorrow. That's how streamlined the process has become. So, the next time you scribble a note, unwrap a box, or flip through a magazine, remember, you're holding the result of a global, massive, centuries-refined process that turns trees into something we use every single day. So, let's rewind for a second. We started out in a forest of pine, spruce, fir, and eucalyptus. We watched machines harvest them like futuristic lumberjacks. We saw logs stripped of their bark, chipped down into tiny pieces, and cooked into a slurry of pulp. Then came the cleaning, bleaching, pressing, and drying until those fibers finally became something familiar. And after being rolled up into reels bigger than a bus, the paper is sliced, packaged, and shipped around the world. And just like that, the journey from tree to notebook, receipt, or novel is complete. The next time you jot down a grocery list or unwrap something in a cardboard box, you'll know there's a whole chain of forests, machines, and workers behind that one simple sheet. Here's another fun fact to blow your mind. Every year, the world produces over 400 million tons of paper. That's enough to wrap around the earth multiple times, literally papering the planet. That's billions upon billions of sheets traveling from factories to schools, offices, shops, and homes. And while digital screens may dominate more of our lives every day, paper is still one of the most universal practical inventions ever. But here's the good news. Recycling paper is one of the simplest, most effective ways we can save trees and energy. A single ton of recycled paper can save up to 17 trees, 7,000 gallons of water, and enough electricity to power an average home for six months. So, every time you toss paper into the recycling bin instead of the trash, you're actually helping close the loop. So what do you think? The process is kind of magical, isn't it? A tree that once provided shade in a forest might now be holding your to-do list or wrapping up your burger. If you enjoyed seeing how paper is made, we've got a question for you. What product should we cover next? Should we dive into the world of steel? Explore how plastic takes shape? Or maybe, even better, find out how the world's favorite guilty pleasure, chocolate, is made in giant factories. Drop your pick in the comments, smash that like button if you learned something new, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our next factory deep dive. Because trust us, this is just the beginning of how everyday things are made on a mind-blowing scale.